started. So uh, first of all, hi everyone. This is Panos, co-founder of Pinoe. Uh, and I'm very excited to have uh, Dr. Stephen Yiannopoulos joining me uh, here today uh, from the United States. I'm actually in Greece still, flying back to the US today. Um, uh, Stephen, who is uh, a fellow Greek American and a, uh, a longtime Pinoe user, uh, is a very, very experienced health professional. Uh, that also has had a lot of experience uh, utilizing Pinoy on a very diverse uh, range of clients. And, you know, he has been doing that because he has seen how Pinoy can yield retention, better health outcomes, and ultimately better performance for his business. So uh, without further ado, uh, I would like to open it up to him, have him uh, give us a little bit of background on himself, what he does, and then we can move on with the discussion. I'm going to be taking over from there, uh, devoting a few minutes to uh, give an overview of what Pnoe is uh, and the different things we offer as a company, just so that we are all on the same page around the different things that are available. And then we're going to dive into the uh, main part of the discussion, which is uh, Dr. Stephen walking us through in a very detailed way, the uh, steps that go into fulfilling the complete Pinoy experience that he also utilizes in his practice. So, uh, Stephen, thank you much. Th thank you so much for uh, joining us here today. Uh, over to you. Oh, thank you so much. It's great to be here. I'm very excited to talk about this subject since uh, Pinoy has definitely been a big part of my practice, uh, not only for my patients, but also for my own personal journey. So uh, just to give a, a sense of who I am and what, what I do, uh, I've uh, been practicing 23 years in Manhattan um, in New York City, just uh, decided after the pandemic that I was going to leave Manhattan and um, venture off into providing products and services to my, my colleagues, uh, doctors around the country, but also I never really left practice and, and I'm still very active in practice. And that's very important to me because I never wanted to be that person who uh, decided to teach other doctors how to do things when I no longer practice and being in practice is very important to me. Uh, what I do today is very different from what I did a year ago, two years ago, five years ago. And I've spent the better part of the last 15 years really uh, addressing, so just to give you a little bit of background, I'm a chiropractor. I have a postgraduate degree in neurology. I spent most of my career specializing in basically what we would call brain-based disorders. And that encompasses a lot of things, but I pretty much settled on sports concussion for quite a few years. And when you work on the brain, you realize that people do have uh, people with brain dysfunction or people with challenges to uh, brain function will always invariably have some metabolic concerns. So I found it in the early 2000s to be very important for me to become well-versed on blood chemistry and understanding metabolic health. So that's kind of like the three-legged stool of my practice and, and my knowledge. It's chiropractic care, structural health, it's neurological, understanding the brain and nervous system and how it in, uh, interacts with the with the body and the environment. And of course, looking at metabolic health through blood chemistry and now through cardiometabolic testing. Uh, it's again, not something that I would consider myself an expert in, but the beauty of Pinoe is I have all the ex experts at my fingertips um, for when I need them. And that's uh, a very important point. Uh, so what I really believe is that since especially since the pandemic, we've learned that the metabolic health of our nation is really in question uh, in, in, in a lot of different ways. And the medical profession seems to not have a, a handle on that. They're pretty much addressing crisis care and ma managing disease and um, not really addressing how helping people improve their metabolic health, reverse metabolic disease, or, or to really establish longevity in life. And I think that the chiropractic profession is uniquely positioned for that because we're 60,000 strong, we're we're primary portal of entry, we're board certified and licensed to uh, do health assessments, we're uh, trained in, we're board certified and trained in diagnostics. And this is a very powerful tool because as a chiropractor, I've seen over the years, 
the metabolic deterioration of my patients has resulted in everything that walks into the office. So when you hear metabolic health, people are usually thinking about weight loss, but you know, weight loss really infers either obesity or approaching obesity. And then that means there are me several metabolic diseases in progress and the outward manifestation of that is going to be obesity. So yes, it's easy to say, you know, I want to get involved in weight loss, but what does weight loss really mean? Weight loss means improving somebody's metabolic health with the numbers coming off the scale as being a nice side effect of that. So that's kind of my background. And, um, you know, I'll turn it over to you, uh, Panos, if you want to ask me any specific questions regarding how, how I use Panos. Of course, of course. Yeah. So what I would like to do at this point is maybe um, uh, go through a very short presentation so that everyone is fully aware of what goes into Pinawi, what is breath analysis. And after uh, we uh, go through this, we can then uh, turn it over into a conversation and dive into uh, the steps that go into the Pinawi experience. So uh, I'll start sharing my screen. Awesome. So uh, just a little bit of historical background on breath analysis. Breath analysis is not something new. It has been around for you know about 100 years. And uh, it's commonly known as view to max testing or metabolic testing. We use the term breath analysis because as we will see later on in the presentation, there's actually a lot more than just view to max and metabolic rate that is derived from this assessment. So it, it is something that, you know, we've known in the world of science for quite some time. It's actually the first assessment that we turned into, the first modality that we turned into uh, that uh, in our um, effort to quantify the energy expenditure of the human body. And then over time, throughout the decades of the previous century, this assessment found applicability in different fields of medicine, including cardiology, pulmonology, uh, dietetics, and so on and so forth. And this is why um, today it is widely recognized by many key uh, medical organizations as a fundamental assessment for assessing many different areas of our physiology. And you could argue that the combined operation of these biological areas is what we uh, refer to as metabolism, which is the process through which we convert nutrients into the energy that we need in order to survive and sustain our bodies. And the main systems that you can analyze through breath analysis are really broken down into the following. First of all, we have the trifecta of the oxygen chain. These are the systems that participate in oxygen consumption and carbon dioxide production. And these would be your cardiovascular system, your heart and you know the blood and blood vessels. Uh, which is basically the pump and all the you know pumping uh, uh, plumbing across the body. We have the lungs, which is the absorber, and then we have the cells where the actual oxygen uh, is absorbed and utilized to oxidize nutrients. But then the nervous system is obviously highly involved in this process because of its connection to our breathing apparatus, our lungs, and then the way we breathe is also going to heavily impact the way we uh, think and our cognition. Uh, aka um, lungs and the way we breathe will heavily impact brain function and then they will uh, uh, it will obviously also uh, impact posture um, now uh, the thing however with breath analysis is that despite its very established value uh, up until today it had seen very very minimal utilization and it's only been a few years where we've seen a significant surge in interest towards due to max testing, breath analysis, and so on and so forth. And really the main problems behind the underutilization of breath analysis in wellness and the clinical practice has been the fact that devices were very expensive to acquire and operate. You needed someone who was very well-versed in multiple different areas of physiology to analyze or fully analyze all the data coming out of a test. And then last but not least, you also needed uh, a highly trained nutritionist and sports scientist in order to convert the information coming from a breath analysis test into a diet plan and workout plan 
that leverages this information. Uh, so uh, what we did as a company is we basically addressed these three issues, first of all, by turning the device into something that is small, portable, easy to use, then built the entire software infrastructure to do all the analysis that would require a lot of expertise and time if someone was to do it manually. And then also coupled it with a service that includes uh, trained nutritionists and trainers, as well as a complete software platform for nutrition programming, training programming, and client monitoring in order to bridge the gap between the uh, test that is being provided and also a full program that is ultimately what the consumer wants. Uh, consumers don't want to know what their view to max is. They don't want to know what their metabolic rate is. I mean, they do. It's, you know, obviously a fun fact, but the main thing is they want to know how to improve it. Because we made it small, portable, accessible, easy, uh, you now see breath analysis being conducted in places that would never have been possible before. Uh, places, you know, uh, high-end hospitality facilities like uh, like uh, Four Seasons, like uh, uh, Equinox and many other places. And that speaks to how by making it easy to conduct as a test, but then also by automating all the follow-up process, it is now something that the average health center, wellness center can actually put in place. A little bit of science behind breath analysis. So these are the fundamental signals that are generated from a test. And what you see here is the actual breath by breath profile uh, uh, as it's being measured by the three sensors you need to have in a complete breath analysis system. And these are the flow sensor, which is what you see on the mask, it measures volume of air, uh, oxygen concentration and CO2 concentration. And as the person breathes in and out, you see these three wave waveforms occurring in real time. Now, by taking these three waveforms and analyzing them, <clears throat> you can calculate 23 biomarkers. And some of these biomarkers are pretty well known, like VO2 max and metabolic rate, but there is a lot more to it. As I said earlier, it's not just these two biomarkers. There's actually uh, uh, 21 other biomarkers, and each one of them has something to tell you about a different part of your physiology. For instance, O2 pulse, which indicates how much oxygen your heart is pumping into the system, uh, into your body, uh, is a very important one if you're looking to understand heart fitness. Uh, or VE over VCO2, uh, which basically shows how effective your cardiorespiratory system is in discharging CO2, is actually a great marker for understanding if everything is okay with your lungs, and so on and so forth. And really the very important thing with breath analysis is that it provides probably the biggest bang for the buck when it comes to uh, balancing, striking the right balance between diagnostic specificity and diagnostic spectrum. In other words, it can give you a very reliable assessment on many different biological areas um, without taking up a lot of time, without needing uh, to um, get some sort of blood draw or other specimen and send it to the lab, which is what makes it easy, fast, highly reliable, and quite uh, well encompassing when it comes to uh, understanding the biological needs of a person. Um, a few um, you know, low level details about the test. There's two types of tests you can conduct with uh, the Pnoe device or with any a gold standard breath analysis device. There's the resting metabolic rate test and then there's the active metabolic rate test. And then the combination obviously uh, is gonna be better than just doing one or the other. Uh, and uh, what you do is you conduct the test, we take the data over the cloud and then we analyze it. Uh, some of the key things that you will find in our reports uh, would be, first of all, biological age assessment. We use VO2 max in order to assess a person's biological age. And we do so because VO2 max is actually one of the strongest predictors of how long and well someone is going to live according to the American Heart Association. We measure um, their metabolic rate and as a result, we can understand how many calories they need to consume in order to either maintain weight, gain weight or lose weight. Um, we also measure fat oxidation. And so uh, we can understand how many uh, fats, carbs, and proteins you need to be consuming. 
uh, and because we also analyze how efficiently oxygen flows through your body across your heart, lungs, and your cells, we can also identify the optimal breakdown between resistance interval and endurance training in your weekly training regimen. And then last but not least, another very important thing that comes out of the test, this is actually from the active test, is your personalized training zones. And uh, knowing your training zones is going to give you the biggest bang for the buck when it comes to your endurance and, and interval training. Because, for example, my zone two is very different than uh, Steven's zone two, which is you know very different than a, another person's zone two. And the thing is, uh, and this is just an example of zone two, that we burn the most amount of fats in zone two, and that produces the highest rate of mitochondrial biogenesis. Meaning that if you know your zone two, your steady state cardio is going to be a lot more efficient than if you're just training at a random training zone that you think is your train that you think is your uh, zone two. Um, last point, and then we're turning it on to Steven. One of the most important things that we do in our reporting and uh, our analysis is that we integrate with the services that your practice has. So if you're doing IVs or if you're doing bioptimization uh, uh, treatments like red light therapy, cryotherapy, you name it, we can take all of this information and we can recommend what modality is appropriate based on your biological limitations that have been identified from the test. And most of you can understand why this is very important because through this test, which is easy, it's instant, it's non-invasive, it doesn't require blood draw or lab work, you can provide um, uh, quantitative guidance uh, that is based on the person's biological limitations as to what treatments and what uh, bioptimization modalities someone has to pursue. And this personalization is what increases adoption of these services and also retention. Um, that was pretty much an overview of everything we do here at PNOE. It's also a good segue for uh, Stephen to share his experience and how he has structured his client's uh, experience with PNOE. So uh, over now to you, Stephen. All right. So thank you. That was a very a uh, concise and technical explanation of what PNOE is. And I believe the most important value that I provide for my patients and my and my clients, and my, again, my clients are other doctors who I help incorporate these services into their practice, is how do we simplify that? What does it mean to me? So first of all, what does it mean to me as a chiropractor? What does it mean to me as a healthcare provider? And then what does it mean to me as a consumer? One of the explanations that I used just the other day, and Panos, please correct me if I'm wrong, because you're far more steeped in the uh, academics of, of this process than I am. But one of the explanations that I use, you had mentioned that metabolism is how we convert our food into energy. Uh, and I agree with that. And I would probably add how we convert our food and our body into energy, right? Because sometimes food is not available and we have to consume stored energy, right? And and that would be our body, our body fat. It even could be our body muscle, which we aim, don't want to lose. Aim into that. And actually how you convert your own body to energy is going to be very telling around how your body actually looks like. Correct. Correct. And, and you know, again, what are the motivations that that people have? So the explanation that I had given was, you know, if you were, if your automobile was consuming a certain amount of gas, uh, based on your use, and you had a steady su supply of gasoline into the gas tank of that car, and if the amount coming into the car exceeded the amount that you were going to burn, then you're going to make a mess, right? You're going to have overflow, and you're going to spill the gasoline all over the place. The only way to uh, prevent that is to either slow the flow of gasoline coming into the tank, or get a bigger tank, or get a bigger engine. Um, so obviously, when it comes to the human body, it's a very similar scenario. How much food is coming in? And I believe for many people, they believe too much is coming in compared to what's going out. Sedentary lifestyles are a, just a, a reality for us. And, you know, decreasing that amount is a challenge. Otherwise, if it were easy, then every, every nobody would be overweight. But you can increase the size of your engine. 
and you can increase the size of your gas tank. So on the gas tank side, the analogy is if I were to uh, stand next to myself without a shirt when I was 20 years old, and let's just say when I was 20 years old, I was six feet tall and 200 pounds. And today I'm six feet tall, 200 pounds. A 54-year-old Stephen Janopoulos and a 20-year-old Stephen Janopoulos are going to look very different. Um, the 20-year-old Stephen Janopoulos is going to have a lot more muscle which is the gas tank. That's the sink in which you have to store the energy that you're bringing in. We lose muscle over time. Uh, we can slow that down. We can speed it up. There's many different ways to do that, but it's the, the size of the sink or the gas tank that is going to be the limiting factor, and that's modifiable. And then the engine, well, the engine is the accumulation of all of the mitochondria you have because that's the you know, the, the engines, uh, of energy production and what you meant, what you mentioned about zone two and how important it is for mitochondrial biogenesis. So this is important for anyone looking to, well, lose weight. We all understand what's going on with Ozempic and these types of GLP one agonist medications and how Medicare is actually going to start paying for them because the amount of money that they're going to save, no matter how expensive these drugs are, the amount of money they believe they'll save in heart disease and and uh, or or ca cardiac emergency procedures and knee replacements and hip replacements and all of the things, uh, they they see how important this is. Well, I think they're going to find out there's some other challenges that are going to come with that, but for our purposes here. Understanding this is important because what happens with 98% of all weight loss programs, you know, there's a complete reversal of your success uh, within two years. Uh, and, and, you know, why is that? Well, you know, it, it's that biggest loser phenomenon where our metabolic rate drops at a, you know, precipitously, and we can have great success losing weight in three, six months, but the the stimulus for it to come back on is just too great it's too overwhelming and people feel that oh they're they're just weak and and they have a, a flaw in their character and you and i both know that weight loss programs too often are just due to uh such a dramatic reduction in metabolic rate because they're losing their body they're losing mitochondria they're losing muscle and their metabolic rate drops so you mentioned in the Pnoe, one of the tests we do is resting metabolic rate. So you just put the mask on, lay down for 10 minutes and relax. And we take the data. And that data is not just your calorie needs to exist. That data is, is far more important. We can look at your respiratory rate and uh, draw conclusions about your mental function. We can look at your respiratory rate and draw conclusions about your breathing me mechanisms as far as they relate to rib mechanics and for a chiropractor, the thoracic spinal function um, and, and how that relates to posture and risk for spinal injury. Uh, so there's a lot of information that's drawn just from that resting metabolic rate. I even had a case where uh, she swore that her problem was her thyroid and, and the medication she was on was appropriate because her thyroid stimulating hormone was just where it needs to be. Her T4 was just where it needs to be. And she just felt everything was a mess. And we did a RMR with her and her metabolic rate was far lower than we expected. So I sent her out for a, a free T3 and her free T3 was laboratory low. It was, it was, terribly low. So she was suffering from hypothyroidism with a normal TSH and a normal T4. It showed up on the PNOE as a, a dramatically low resting met metabolic rate. So that's an example of how hypothyroidism can actually affect and vice versa. You could also have hyperthyroidism affect the metabolic uh, presentation that, that we see. So, you know, there's a lot of information we can glean that's specific to many different goals, whether it be dietary goals, structural goals, um, medical goals, and a clinician who knows how to read these tests uh, can can now glean so much more information, uh, you know, with, with, with this, whereas years ago, you know, 
the only reason to do a VO2 max or resting metabolic rate was to know your calorie burn or your calorie needs to sustain yourself or, or, or if you wanted to calculate your calorie deficit, which is, again, very important, but there's other information you can glean. And then VO2 max was for athletes. It was never for the 65-year-old guy who's looking to optimize his health, fitness, and long, longevity. Um, so you mentioned the, the, uh, the exercise zones. I use that in my practice very, very, uh, very, very much because, you know, we have patients who overestimate their zone too. They'll, they're like, Oh, I don't need to do the, the test because if I do this calculation that I found online, this calculation will tell me my zone too. And unfortunately those calculations are based on very, very fit people, particularly athletes and not the average person. So they're overestimating their zone two, they're working out in zone three, and they're wondering why they have fatigue, they have chronic inflammation, they have injuries, uh, and why they're, they're so, uh, you know, why their appetite for, for refined carbohydrates is so strong, because they're moving beyond the fat burning, well into the sugar burning. And that's, you know, that goes against what, what we're trying to do. And to this point, uh, <clears throat> Stephen, I would like to share a slide uh, with the audience, which shows, um, a second. So this is, these are the results uh, for three different types of individuals uh, from AMR tests. These is the active test, active metabolic rate test. And what you see here is the, fat oxidation and carbohydrate oxidation as it evolves, as ex as exercise intensity increases, right? So uh, if we put any person <clears throat> on a treadmill or a stationary bicycle, and we ask them to perform a graded exercise test, meaning that there's going to be a gradual increase in, in intensity, what we're going to see is this gradual shift from fat oxidation to carbohydrate oxidation, which is obviously apparent in all three cases. Uh, first case, trained athletes. Uh, second case, active individuals. Uh, third case, uh, sedentary and metabolically impaired uh, individuals. Uh, as you can see, however, the point at which this crossover um, uh, occurs, which is when fat oxidation becomes less prevalent than carbohydrate oxidation, is being pushed more to the right as the person becomes more metabolically healthy. And, you know, this is something that some people in the medical industry and the, and, 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 and the medical realm in general, that includes also science, have known for some time, but it's only now becoming uh, part of the metabolic evaluation of a person. Uh, but it's actually one of the most important things because the more capillary density we have, the more mitochondria we have, the more oxygen we can bring into the cell, and since fat is a molecule that always requires oxygen to be oxidized, uh, the more fat we will be able to burn. And this is reflected uh, 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 This is reflected in these three graphs. And you see that as someone develops a better mitochondrial profile, which is almost equivalent to saying better metabolic profile, not exactly the same, but you know, a big part of our metabolic health is our mitochondrial health. Uh, the more fat reliant this person is going to be, uh, the easier it will be for this person to burn fat when they go on a deficit, the more muscle they will be able to preserve as they go on a deficit, the easier it will be for this person to recover. Um, and the more this person will be able to utilize fat as a fuel source ra ra rather than carbohydrates. And as a result, the better uh, body composition uh, this person will end up evolving over time. Uh, this is just like, a, yeah, go ahead. No, no, th this is great. So <clears throat> let me, uh, so the bottom. And, and, and just to give, and just to give credit, this is, this, this, this slide is from another client of ours, uh, Dr. Leonard Pastrana. Uh, he's with New BioAge. Uh, they do a lot of work with peptides and uh, GLP-1s and different types of treatments. They obviously combine uh, GLP-1s with lifestyle interventions. Uh, but they are, you know, obviously big believers in metabolic testing, long time no users. I uh, just wanted to give credit to Leonard, uh, who's a, you know, uh, very uh, uh, close affiliate to ours. 
No, that that that's great. So the bottom graph there shows the metabolically unhealthy person who has that crossover very very quickly. So just just imagine uh, that person, you know, is just walking their dog. They they could be crossing over at that point, whereas the person in the middle might have to uh, go for a more brisk walk on a treadmill uh, for for twenty minutes before that that happens. And then the more fit you are, the further you push it to to the right. But this is so important because it's not fat oxidation is not just telling us about body composition, which is wonderful. If you're going to use GLP ones and you want to lose weight and you don't want to lose muscle and keep your metabolic rate high, perfect. This is far better, in my opinion, than doing a DEXA scan. Although a DEXA scan is very accurate, it's backward looking. It's not telling us about functional physiology right now the way the PNOE is. So you you could look at somebody's active test and their resting test while they're going through a weight loss program and identify if their metabolic rate is dropping too fast, uh, which will then contribute to their the reversal of, of, of their gains over time. However, let's just go to the mitochondria for a second, because when we talk about fat oxidation, we're talking about the use of mitochondria and the most mitochondrial dense uh, you know, tissue in the human body is your brain and nervous system, right? So your central nervous system will, it's 2% of your body weight. It could use up to 30% of your oxygen. And we want to- And you know, also the most metabolically sensitive. Correct. But I also want to direct our attention to the muscles that give us posture. Um, muscles that give us posture are non-fatiguing mu muscles as opposed to your bicep you know, which is not related to posture is very fatiguing, you know, just carry a, a heavy grocery bag for, for a few minutes and your, your arm will get fatigued and achy, but your postural muscles hold you up against gravity all day long. And they don't fatigue. They're non-fatigable because they're dark meat and they're dark meat because they have mitochondrial density. And, you know, for spinal health, which I think is incredibly important, not just from a chiropractic perspective, but also from a longevity perspective, it's the fine movements of your spine and its ability to react to the environment that will dictate information from the environment getting to your brain, and then your brain utilizing that information uh, in, or, in, in, in order to enhance its own function. So when we talk about longevity, when we talk about the, you know, uh, the way in which we decline, zone two exercise as you get older becomes so much more important to prevent neurodegeneration and musculoskeletal degeneration. We know that musculoskeletal degeneration, poor function of your spine, your knees, your hips, will limit your movement. It will cause atrophy of your muscle. You'll lose mitochondria. So this is a, a strategy to identify exactly where you're at, because we know also with VO2 max, there is a trajectory in which people will decline if they're not active that we could calculate. If you have somebody who's 55 years old and their VO2 max is 23, well, then you can calculate at 10% per decade when they will drop below 20 and be considered by Medicare as being disabled. So you could take someone who's my age, 54 years old, and say, hey, your VO2 max is here right now. If you continue living the way you do, by the time you're whatever, 75, 80, you're going to be in that zone where you cannot take care of yourself. And to me, you know, there's nothing more important to, to all of us to, because we know that we can improve our VO2 and then we can improve it to a point. And then we can, of course, slow that trajectory down. We don't want it to decline fast. We want it to decline more slowly. And there's no better, in my opinion, there's no better strategy uh, than assessing somebody's VO2 uh, for establishing a plan for longevity. Pa Panos, are you still there? <laughs> 100%, 100%, sorry, I, I couldn't unmute myself. Um, so that is a great, you know, overview of, you know, why is breath analysis through the different things it offers, 
relevant for the average person whose objective is I want to live longer, better. I just want a higher quality life. I want lifespan, but I also want health span. Um, my question to you now is how do you structure a client's experience within your practice such that these things become a seamless um, flow of events that the person is going to follow. And as a result, that will lead to better retention. It will re lead to high revenue for your business and will ultimately lead to better outcomes for the person. So, okay, let, let me address this. When it comes to uh, I, providing a, a plan for people, we want to use evidence-based um, principles. And when it comes to the evidence behind VO2 metabolic rate and some other, other factors, there's they're tried and true. We have, you know, like you said, nearly a hundred years of research, uh, all pointing in the exact same direction. There is no confounding, um, you know, there, there, there's no, uh, you know, like where there are some people trying to say that this diet is better than that diet based on the research and they fight with each other. I like to use assessments where there's no argument. Uh, it's tried and true. And what's tried and true are five things that I do in my office. One is VO2 and RMR. I like to do um, you know, a, a complete metabolic blood panel because of how tried and true that is, right? In the in the world of radiology, X-ray has been around for 130 years. And, you know, X-ray is something that's used to determine problems in the musculoskeletal system. Uh, and and you, you really can't deny that. Well, same thing with blood work. If you're going to do blood work, that's not esoteric. That pretty much is across the board. You know, comprehensive metabolic panel, uh, CBC, lipid panel, all of the inflammatory markers, thyroid function. These are incredibly important things to track, especially when it comes to metabolic health. The third thing I like to do is look at body composition. Uh, body composition, I want to know your subcutaneous fat. I want to know your visceral fat. I want to know your lean body mass. Then I like to look at muscle strength and quality of movement. So there are five parameters. We can use things that can be scored, right? The VO2 has a score. The resting metabolic rate has a score. Like there's numbers that we can track. Blood work, of course, is numbers that we can track. Muscle strength, again, there are numbers that can be tracked. And the research behind these in the realm of function and longevity is so powerful and really can't be denied. So those are the five assessments that we do. And we can, again, track that over time, depending on that person's starting point. But ideally, I'd like to do those five assessments twice a year for all of my patients. And you know, we figured out a way to do that. But it's not only doing the assessments, it's what do you do to improve those things? So there's, you know, simple... Uh, instructions that we can give to our patients uh, for improving their muscle strength, improving their, improving their range of motion, improving their VO2. And VO2, uh, you know, there, there's a stigma with VO2 max testing. People think they have to spend 10 minutes in a full, complete, all-out effort, um, you know, that, 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 that might kill them. <laughs> and, and that's not the case. You know that. We grade them over a period of, again, 10 minutes, but for the really fit people, probably 13 or 14 minutes to get them to, to failure. But that, that portion where they're really dialing it in and going to the max is really not, doesn't have to be more than a minute or two. Um, I, I think it's probably much less than that. But even if they can't give 100% effort, there is a point where the technology can project their estimated VO2 max without giving that 100% effort. So we can work with 80-year-old people. We can work with uh, people who are terribly unfit and still get a VO2 max calculation. And what's more important maybe for those people is knowing that crossover. 
and 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 we can have an accurate uh, assessment of that crossover. And again, correct me if I'm wrong, Panos. We can get that assessment without going to a full max effort. But hundred percent, the crossover point is something that will. Uh, for most people occur in lower intensities. So typically what we like to tell our users is that it is okay to stick to a, um, for the ballpark, 70 to 80% of max effort. So it's really something that, you know, for as long as the person is able to go to the gym and or, or go for a run, they should be able to do an AMON test. And every, every one of the assessments that I mentioned can be done you know, with, with staff, right? If you're, if you're a doctor's office, you have a well-trained person, you know, the team at, at Pinoe is going to take the data and provide all the technician has to do is make sure they're doing the test, you know, properly. And, and, you know, that's not a difficult thing to do. Uh, resting metabolic rate, about 10 minutes, the active test, about 10 minutes, drawing blood. We send them to a laboratory, uh, uh, a, a functional movement screen is a very standard pro protocol that can be about 10 or 12 minutes. So, so you, you know, and then looking at muscle strength and um, body composition, you don't have to use a DEXA scan. You could use something that is directionally accurate, like an in-body scan. I find those to be more than beneficial, uh, especially if you instruct the patient to show up at the same time of day, same day of the week on subsequent testing, you have a very accurate analysis of that person's health. And again, designing a plan to improve it doesn't require the person to run to the track and start doing sprints. Uh, VO2, I'm sorry, a zone two exercise improves VO2. Uh, breath holds while you're walking improves VO2. Breathing through your nose on a regular basis without effort is going to improve VO2. So there's so many things that you can do to improve all of these parameters. Uh, I have one, one of my patients, he's 80 years old. He wants to improve his muscle strength and size. So we have him on blood flow restrictive bands around his arms and his legs, and he's able to exercise safely with minimal resistance, let's just say 20 pounds of resistance. And because of the blood flow restriction and the lactate buildup, he's able to perceive his muscles are able to think that instead of 20 pounds, it's 40 pounds or 50 pounds, and he can get the benefit of hypertrophy from doing that. So there, there, there's no shortage of ideas to bring this into practice. And I don't think it requires a whole lot of time by the uh, managing doctor or, or or the clinician, as long as you know systems or or uh, procedures are put in place. And I think we may have lost Panos. I think we may have lost him. I'll just keep talking here. Uh, <laughs> see if I can provide some more value and information here. So. Uh, when it comes to uh, applying this in, in in practice, you know, if you were to take those five assessments, if you were to do all five of them or just two or three of them, you have to determine what is going to be profitable for you in your time. So I, I believe that you need to work backwards from that number and, you know, calculate the amount of time it's going to take for you to provide those assessments and then you can charge accordingly. People will pay. They will pay out of pocket for this. Um, you know, the target market that I think is very uh, important for this, the target market I, I like is people like me, uh, male and female, um, between 40 and, you know, 80 years old, uh, where their objective is longevity. They've worked hard their whole life. Uh, they've raised their families. They've sacrificed and let their health go in order to become successful business people. And, and now they're empty nesters and they want to travel and enjoy the fruits of their labor. Uh, they want to know that they're going to be able to do that and not suffer the consequences of, you know, retirement and then getting sick uh, precipitously thereafter. So I remember when I first graduated, uh, the number of patients I had who would pretty much wind up on, you know, ill, within months of retiring was staggering. 
And when I say ill, it doesn't mean that they just got sick and died. It it means that they needed doctor's appointments like multiple times a month. Um, they needed to have multiple prescriptions. Uh, they 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 couldn't take the time away uh, because they had fear of what what would happen to them if if they would travel. So, hey, Panos, you're back. I I thought I'd just keep back, on sorry. talking. Yeah, 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 hundred percent, hundred percent. Yeah, we had a connection issue, but I'm good now. Okay. Where, 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 what I was just uh, talking about, I don't know if I was being recorded by you or if, if, if that. No, no, the recording, the recording is not done by me. So, uh, okay. you know, the full conversation, uh, including the part that I was out, is going to be available uh, online. Uh, Very good. You know, uh, yeah. So, go ahead. Yeah. So I, I was just discussing on, you know, who the ideal client is, right? The ideal client, it can really be anyone, but. For me personally, uh, I, I find, you know, the, the range between 40 and 80, uh, where, where people have, you know, really been successful their whole lives, raising their families, running their businesses, and unfortunately sacrificing their health, they need to know that retirement is coming and they need to prepare for that in a way that allows them to do all the things they want to do, play with their grandchildren, go on vacation, you know, uh, you and I were lucky enough to meet up in in Greece, and and uh, I know you spent a lot of time there th this year. When after we left you in Athens, we went to Crete and hiked down uh, the the uh, Samaria Gorge uh, in Crete. You know, downhill, uh, thirteen uh, thirteen kilometers, six hours. It was brutal, and it was so much fun, and I was so proud that I, you know. Because I remember my my father in his mid fifties, he wasn't doing that. There was no no chance, and I was able to do that with my kids, uh, who you know they they had to keep up with me. So, I think most people have that desire, and you have to be deliberate. You you can't live a sedentary life in an office forty hours a week for thirty years, and expect to not decline and deteriorate uh, accordingly, based on what we know. We know how to reverse that. We know how to measure that. And the PNOE, the blood work, the strength assessment, the body composition assessment, and the movement assessment, those five things I find to be the, the most evidence-based and the easiest to do in an office setting. Awesome. Well, uh, Stephen, that was awesome. Uh, I think it provides a lot of context to people as to what a successful practice should include and how they should uh, approach biometric testing uh, and how it's very possible to apply uh, advanced biometric testing on the average person who just wants to live longer and better. And while doing so, you're not just, you know, throwing in fancy stuff just for the heck of it and to charge fees. You're actually doing it because it is the better path to health. Um, so, um, with this, uh, you know, I would like to thank Stephen for joining us. Uh, you know, uh, he's, uh, you know, a, a very, you know, experienced person uh, when it comes to metabolic testing and also using other modalities. He's also quite big on social media. I'm a big follower and big fan of the content that you're putting out. So I would like to, uh, <laughs> Dr. Stephen, yeah. I would like to welcome everyone to look him up on Instagram and start following him as well. <clears throat> um, we are, um, you know, coming up, uh, you know, at our, um, you know, one hour mark, and I would like to pretty much thank everyone for joining here. Um, we were, we're going to be posting a link uh, that you guys can use in order to get in touch with someone from our team in case you have questions or in case you're considering getting to know into your business. The best next step would be to contact one of our specialists and uh, get uh, very detailed information around, you know, what the, you know, um, the test involves in terms of like the logistics, what the different packages uh, include, uh, pricing and all of that stuff. Uh, and then also how it can be applied to your business specifically. As a company, we work with a very wide range of businesses um, going from, clinics like uh, Stevens business, like a chiropractic clinic, all the way up to uh, high-end fitness, like Equinox Hospitality, like um, uh, uh, Four Seasons and everything in between that includes pretty much 
uh, the realm of integrated medicine. Um, so uh, thank you again for joining, Stephen. I hope to see you soon uh, in maybe one of the conferences. As a company, we attend many conferences. So uh, if you are uh, you know, looking to get in touch with us there, follow us on Instagram. We do post about all the conferences that we go to, and I know that we have about 15 coming up until the end of the year. Uh, obviously, A4M um, uh, yeah, in December and uh, many others uh, in between now and December. Um, if, so, anybody wants, yeah. if anybody wants wants to see me, I'll be uh, next uh, on the Saturday, the 21st. I'll be at the New York Chiropractic Council Convention in Westchester, New York. Uh, you can see that uh, on my social media. <laughs> Um, I'll be presenting for two hours on metabolic health, a lot of this uh, topic here. And I'll also believe in November, I'll be at the Florida Chiropractic Association in Naples. So um, I also travel quite, quite a bit, get on stage and, and discuss metabolic health. And I just love talking about this stuff. So thank you for having me. Of course. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Stephen. Thanks, everyone. Um, bye.